And today marks the final um, message to our sermon series from old uh, to new as we cover chapter 13. It has been a long journey through this book of Hebrews. Um, as we've covering, uh, been covering this letter since uh, the first Sunday of January. That's how, that's how long we've been in this book. And the recipients of this letter, again, as a reminder, were a group of Christians who were questioning about going and abandoning the faith and going back to Judaism. Because of the intense persecution uh, they were experiencing um, for following Christ. And throughout this letter, we hear the same argument really being repeated over and over again. And that the old covenant that these people were thinking about going back to in Judaism uh, was, has become obsolete when compared to what has been given to them, to all of us, in God's new covenant that was written uh, by the blood of Christ. The old covenant that God made with his people has always, was always meant to be fulfilled and reestablished with a far superior and greater covenant that would be brought, um, that would bring us as people who accept it into a right relationship with God. And, and in that right relation, we're basically being pardoned from our sin. And from it, we can have a relationship with God as he created us to have. When he created Adam and Eve, they were meant to walk with God in the garden. And because of our sin, we were kicked out. The man was kicked out of the garden. We're no longer able to have that relationship. We've gone through countless times through Jewish history, and we're going to in this sermon series, next sermon series, that they were unable to have that relationship with God. That only one man was able to enter into the Holy of Holies, but through Christ and the new covenant, we all, all that have accepted Jesus, can walk and have a relationship with Christ. Far greater than the high priest of Israel ever uh, could have had. And so all throughout the Old Testament, we see that the new covenant was being pointed to. So the writer has laid out all the evidence and made an extremely convincing argument for these Hebrew Christians that he's writing to not to lose faith, but to keep running the race of faith that has been laid out before them. Going back to Judaism would would be actually take them further away from where God desired them to be as his children. Which brings us to the close of this letter, chapter 13 of Hebrews. So if you want to make your way to chapter 13, that's where we're going to be spending the entire time. I'll have scriptures up on the screen behind me, but that's where we're going to spend all of our time in chapter 13. And after all that we covered, what does the author of Hebrews want to leave for his readers as it comes to its close? You know, as we write a letter, it might be the most important statement at the end. Usually, for most of us, at the end of a letter or an email, if it's to someone we care about, it says, love, my name, right? Or sincerely, or make sure you take out the trash, or something like that. Don't, don't forget this thing. And so it's, it's a very important thing. So in his letter, what does he come to the close in? And well, he has a lot of truths that he wants all of his readers to remember, But I would argue again that the author ever so subtly, once again, whether he knew he did it or not, or I'm just crazy, (laughs) confirms that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, as he's been doing throughout his entire 12 chapter letter, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. You see, in chapter 13, there's so many truths that the writer mentions that he reminds the readers that It's who they need to be and who they should be and what they need to do. But studying it over this past week, I kept on seeing all of it. I'm like, how am I going to fit all of these things in? Like, there there are some that are a personal thing, some that is more of an all-encompassing thing. And and like, how am I going to fit all this in together? And I felt the Spirit say, just look at those again. List them out. So I made a list, and I'm like, wait, these really fit into two distinct categories. Two familiar commands. All of the things that he says in this letter, in this last chapter, fit into two categories. Love God, love people. The great commandment. Maybe you've forgotten about what that is. And in Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 through 40, if you remember it, there's this moment where these religious Jewish leaders who were in the old covenant were trying to trap Jesus. And they go to Jesus and they say, what is the greatest commandment? What, what, what is the most important commandment that we have to do? Again, let me remind you, there's 613 commandments. Which is the most important one that we need to do, teacher? And Jesus goes, oh, well, 
says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And then verse 38, this is the first and the greatest commandment. A second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law, listen to this, the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So once again, Jesus is fulfilling. He's saying, I'm the fulfillment. This is, I, can, I can end all of these, in all these laws and rituals. Just do these things. And so as, as all this, everything in the law, the old covenant has, was summed up in these two commandments because of what Jesus did. So we could receive the new covenant. We no longer have to do the 613 commandments of the law. Within the new covenant, God God's desire is to make the great commandment who you are. So let's dive into this last chapter so I can hopefully illustrate this correlation. I do want to warn you, throughout this entire series, I've read the entire passage we're covering. I'm not going to be doing that this morning. And I'm actually going to be jumping all around in these scriptures and taking them out of order. Okay, and so I'm going to start like in verse 8 and move around. And, and because my, my goal is to put them in the category of the great commandment that they're in. Okay, and so I'm wanting them to kind of, each scripture focus, to go into the part of the great commandment that they belong to, where I see they fit into. So we're going to start in verse 8, which is my favorite part, scripture in this chapter. The writer gives us a reason, a reason for us to have confidence in the love and trust in God, because, as verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Did, did you hear that? I mean, that... If, if there's a truth I want you to know this morning, that's the truth. Okay, I want you to know that. That Jesus is the same yesterday. And as we've seen in Hebrews and, and John and all over the Bible, Jesus, was, Jesus is God. Right? So it, it, you can replace Jesus Christ with God if you want to. If it makes, helps you out here. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. The Holy Spirit is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? Jesus, who is God, is the same as he was in the Old Testament. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand that. So all the things that are happening in the Old Testament, that happen in the Old Testament, that are accounted as Yahweh or Elohim or El Shaddai, all those things, that is Jesus. Okay, so that, I mean, they are one, three in one, Trinity, right? Okay, so he is the same as he was in the Old Testament. So when he parted the Red Sea, he's the same. When he was raining fire down from heaven, he's the same. He's the same God that was closing the mouth of lions with Daniel. He's the same God that was making Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fireproof. He's the same God that put man on, from heaven down. He's the same God that made Jericho's walls tumble down from just walking around it and blowing horse. He's the same God as we read in the Gospels. The one that's healing people, that's casting out demons, that's laying down his life so that we can be forgiven. He's the same God from Acts and all of the epistles. That it, say, that it says thousands are saved daily. He's the same God that puts his power in his people through the Holy Spirit. He's the same God that says that the gates of hell could not stop and overcome. He is the same today. No matter what the world looks like and how crazy it may get, he is the same today. And he will forever be the same. God has not changed and he will not change. What a comfort that is to us that God will never change his mind about us and his plan for us. One of my favorite verses in all the scripture is Romans 5.8. It says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, so just thinking of this idea that God will never change. When I read that verse, God isn't one day going to all of a sudden say, you know what? I think I've changed my mind and I don't think I'm going to love them first while they're still sinners. You know, they don't deserve my love. I'm going to make them earn my love, and then I'll earn them, and then maybe I'll save them. God will never do that, because he is the same. God will never, never do that, even though it's true that we don't deserve it. We don't, and we shouldn't allow, be receive his love, but God doesn't change. He does love us more. He does love us first. He loves us while we were still sinners, and he has gone to every length to make a way for us to be made right with him. Because God is unchanging, we are warned in verse 9 of chapter 13, so do not be attracted by strange new ideas. Why? Because God's opinions and desires do not shift or change. His truth is the only truth. He will not change his desires or expectations for his creation. 
He will not all of a sudden be like, okay, I guess you can do that sin. Okay, I'll let it go now. Enough time has gone by. Or, okay, you don't have to do this anymore. Or, you don't have to honor me anymore. Oh, okay, okay. God will not change. The creator doesn't bow to the wants of his creation. Oh, God, let us do this. God, let us have these, let us worship these pagan gods. Let us, let us be with Baal. Let us do all these things that the foreigners say. No, God is the same as he was yesterday, and he's the same as he is today. Everything we need to know about God has already been given to us in his word. There are no new revelations. God has revealed himself And then he sent his son to be the revelation to the whole world of who he really is in flesh. I heard a saying this week, and it says this. If it's true, it's not new. If it's new, it's not true. There's a lot of truth in that. So there's no reason for churches to need to reinvent or Christians to need to reinvent the newest, best model of being a a, a church. There's no reason to to try to fit the mold of this world or anything like that because all the truth has already been given to us and the model has already been set up in place. A lot of people have come to us and be like, oh, how are you having, Zach, how how is the first church of God having so much success and so much growth and all these baptisms and stuff? I said, we went back old school. What do you mean? I, met, I had a dinner with a, or lunch with a pastor a couple weeks ago, and he's like, man, that just sounds like the Church of Acts. You got it. I went back. We went back to the original plan where we were set up to do. I don't need to do, create a new program and a new, new system and all anything like that. All we have to do is go back to what God had already done and mimic it. And follow his plans and his rules. That's why our mission as a church here at 1COG is to be disciples who make disciples. Be disciples who make disciples. It's the great commission. That's who we are. Nothing new. Because God is the same, we can trust in him. We don't have to rely on our own strengths and our own abilities. It says uh, in this passage, next passage, your strength comes from God's grace, not from the rules, not from rules about food, which don't Help those who follow him. Loving God isn't about following rules or trying to fit a certain mold of a believer. It's about loving God with all that you are. And then understanding your only true worth comes from God's love. None of us are worthy of it. But it's yours if you take it. You can be a son and daughter of God. One of his adopted heirs, if you choose to love him and surrender to the unchangeable God. And friends, let me just tell you, he's worthy of your love. He is so worthy for what he has done for each one of us. In verse 10 through 12, the writer then compares once again the old and the new covenant, particularly focusing on how Jesus is better than the entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament. In that system, there's a lot of death and and blood to atone for all of the people of Israel's sins. But for all the animals that died and for all the animal blood that was shed, none of it was able to accomplish the complete forgiveness of sins. Only Jesus, Jesus' sacrificial death, accomplished the complete forgiveness of sins. His blood alone is the only effective way to cleanse us from the stain of sin in our lives. The Day of Atonement was the one day in Israel's sacrificial system where the high priest got to enter into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, the place where God dwelt, the center room of the tabernacle. When he went in there, the high priest, he offered two sacrifices. The first one was a a bull, and the blood of it was for his own sins. And then he offered the blood of a goat to cover the sins of all of the people of Israel. But the important feature that the author author just plucks out in this, verses 10 through 12, and he highlights is that what happened to the dead animal of those sacrifices after the blood was spilled and it was given to the Lord on the altar. Most cases, in most cases during these things, as I'm actually actively in Leviticus, uh, they would be allowed to eat, the the high priest would be allowed to take that animal and eat it for his family and himself and his family and all the other priests. But when it came to the sin offering on the Day of Atonement, we read in Leviticus that the carcasses of those animals had to be taken out of, out of the tabernacle and out of the camp to be burned away from the camp. 
This sacrifice was not allowed to be consumed by anyone, not for the high priest, not even for the holy Moses. This is why the author tells us why Christ's sacrifice is better. Just as the sacrifice had to be burned outside of the city because it had become defiled, so was Christ who chose to carry the sins outside of Jerusalem to the cross. Verse 12. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. See, the cross on which Jesus bled and died to cover the sins of his people was located outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. In making this point, the writer is trying to tell us that we are reminded that the one we follow actually accomplished what the Day of Atonement could only foreshadow. And in doing so, Jesus became for us the perfect sacrifice that we, unlike the priests of old, can consume and make part of us. See, the the priests were not allowed to eat that sacrifice, that Day of Atonement sacrifice. But guess what we get to do? We get to consume the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about communion that we do once a month, what we do at the beginning of the month where we remember what Jesus did for us. I'm not talking about communion. What I'm talking about, we get to consume the gift of salvation. We make it a part of our life when we accept Jesus. And guess what happens in us? When we accept Jesus in our heart, the Holy Spirit comes and becomes one with us. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells. His dwelling place, the tabernacle of the Lord, becomes inside of us, and he dwells inside of us and lives inside of us. And so we become one with the Lord. So we get to consume the sacrifice when the priests were not allowed. The tabernacle was only a representation of the true heavenly tabernacle that we've talked about here in this series in Hebrews. With Christ, we now have access to God and can have a relationship with him when they could not. Jesus has shown us the greatest example, unselfish, extravagant love. When he went outside the city and endured the cross and suffered for his people, he was loving us with every fiber of his being. Loving us for Jesus meant pain and suffering so that our greatest need could be met. Redemption. God, or does, does not, does Jesus not deserve all of your love? He allowed himself to be covered by our sin, the weight of all the sins, of your sins, the whole world, so that you could have life. Does he not deserve all your love? Outside of the camp was this unclean territory where they were taught to avoid, the the Jews were taught to avoid this uncleanliness. And if there was a moment where they had even got blood on them, they had to go cleanse themselves in a sea and and be gone and separated from their family till the sun went down. And so there was this thing, where this, this mindset of stay away from anything that might defile you. Christ, on the other hand, went out to the unclean place to save the world. So we ought to go outside the camp and join him where he is. Verse 13, so let us go out to him outside of the camp and bear the disgrace he bore. For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to the home yet to come. You see, we are to be different. To be the outsider who doesn't belong in this world. So the Bible tells us that we are to be the salt to this world, the bitterness to this world. We are to be the light in the dark, and there should be a clear distinction between who we are and the rest of the world. Even if, like these Hebrews that this letter has been written to, who are being persecuted and hated, we are to be different from the world. Jesus leads the way in this. He doesn't tell us to do something he didn't do first. And so he tells all believers, which this is glossed over way too easily. He says, hey, before you follow me, count the cost of what it will take to follow me. Count the cost. Understand this. And then he gives us warning after warning. He says, friends, brothers, sisters, they will hate you. They are going to hate you because if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And it's not that they hate you personally, but if they hate the God that is inside of you. They hate me. And he says, as we we see from disciples before, they say, 
Count it all joy that I am counted worthy to be suffering for my Savior's sake. Count it all joy. And understand that as believers, followers, we will be hated. Not because of you're not a good person or not because you shouldn't be liked, but because of this, the Jesus that this world hates dwells inside of your life. Jesus tells us, don't worry, though, when the world hates us, that they will, uh, what, and don't worry about what they will do to you. Because this place, this world that we live in is not our home. It's not what we live for, or at least what we shouldn't be living for. Our real home can't be burned. Our real home can't rust. Our real home uh, cannot be taken away from us. It is eternal and it's heavenly. So he says, run the race. The writer said this constantly, run the race looking towards your heavenly home. As Josh said, every time we run over those hurdles of life, that our eyes should stay on our heavenly reward, the heavenly finish line, our eternal reward where we get to be in the presence of our Savior. Because of all this, as the writer says, our, our response to such a great salvation that we receive because of Christ Jesus' blood and the new covenant and the reward we get of heavenly eternity with him, we should, our, our response should be to continually, uh, verse 15, continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. As I'm going through the Old Testament in preparation for our sermon series, every time they make a sacrifice, God's orders through Moses always has something to say. Do this sacrifice in the right way and it will be a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Do this sacrifice in the right way and it will be a pleasing aroma to the Lord. You see, every time we make a sacrifice for the Lord, it becomes a pleasing aroma to Him. When He's sitting there in his, in, on His throne in Holy Holies, it goes up. Every time you make a sacrifice and you choose God, it goes up to where He is and He goes, Oh. I love that. Oh, that's my child. Thank you. Thank you for choosing me instead of that world. Thank you for choosing to love me instead of your instead of what the world tells you is greater. Oh, yes. Thank you. Our lives of surrender and sacrifice is a pleasing aroma to God. My question to all of us is what aroma are you giving off? What is the aroma that you're giving off? To many in this world, when you love God and you're living really for God, you can become a repulsive stench to the world. When you live for Jesus, you can, become, you can be repulsive. We see that all the time. Just, I mean, look out how some Christians are treated. It can be a repulsive stench. But to others, you living for Christ can be such a draw. Such as, uh, just, oh, i got to smell that. What are, they, what are they offering? I heard a story uh, from a book I'm reading from Jim Cimbala. And in the story, he talks about a sermon he preaches. And, and at the end of the sermon, and, and having a, a constantly, uh, like, hours and hours of church. Like, they have, like, four services, and they're two hours long. He's dead tired, and it was the end of the last service. And a guy comes from his church, and he's in Brooklyn. And he said, there's people that are strung out on coke and drugs and all sorts of different stuff. And homeless people that always make their way into the church, into his church, in the, on a city block in Brooklyn. And this guy starts walking down at the end of his service, starts walking down the altar. And he sees him and he can just tell that he just, he slept in a box or something. He slept on the streets at some point or, or last, th that night. And so he's coming down and Jim's like, oh man, I'm so tired. I just want to go home. I just want to go home, man. I, and I know what that feeling's like. Oh, I just want to go home. I just, I, I just need to rest. I need to rest my heart. I need to rest myself. And this guy's walking down. So Jim's saying, oh, hey, how you doing? Oh, good, good, good. And, and as this guy comes, he can smell this reek, wretched smell of a mix of, of urine, sweat, and poop from this guy who's been homeless. And, and he just, oh, it's, just, it's, it's grotesque. He, he's almost gagging in his mouth. And he, and he says as this guy's coming forward, he sees him, and he's like, they have certain protocols that they need to do that they go through so that they don't just pass out money constantly to homeless people and stuff like that. And so there's certain protocols that they want to go through to really help people. And so this guy's coming forward, but Jim says he's tired. And he's like, so he pulls out his wallet and he starts taking out some money. And he goes, hey, where, he tells the guy before he hands him, he's like, where'd you sleep last night? And the guy goes, oh, I slept in an abandoned car. I slept in an abandoned car. And he goes, okay. And so he takes the money. He starts to hand him the money. And the guy goes, I don't want, I don't want your money. Jim's like, 
You don't want my money? He goes, no. I want this Jesus you're talking about. I want this Jesus, this, this aroma, this, this thing that you're talking about. I want, I want him. I want him. And, and, and he goes on in the story to say that as, that as he began leading this guy to Christ, God just confronted him in a powerful way that he was so concerned about getting rid of him when God was letting his stench, or his stench of Jesus to draw him to himself. And then at the same time, that stench of nastiness, of, of filth and disgust melted away. And he said as he was leading him to Christ, he no longer smelt this man anymore. And as he's leading him to Christ and he was holding him and they were crying and they were weeping, not caring about getting lice, not caring about the fleas or the dirt or the grime or disease on him. He didn't care anymore because that stench, that repulsive smell of the lost sinner became a pleasant aroma to him. Yes, this is why I exist. This is why I exist. See, when we are obedient and completely surrendered and in love with Christ, we will find ourselves like Jesus in defiled places, being drawn to those repulsive outcasts, but not to sin with them, but to bring them the salvation of the gospel that saved and transformed your very life. And that brings us to the second part of the great commandment, love, and this is shorter, love people, which seems a little more difficult these days. The writer starts by telling the readers in verse 1 to keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Remember, this is the very first verse of this chapter 13, so this is very important, and he wants us to understand to make sure that believers know how important it is to love those in the family of God. Even amid persecutions and struggles along their journey. That you can't belong in your own little world because you're struggling and being persecuted, but we have to be connected to a body of believers, a spiritual family of believers, which is why it is one of, one of our four pillars as a church, community. Because you cannot run this race of life without someone running next to you, cheering you on. You can do this! Picking you up when you fall down. You got this! That's why we do so much things with community. I'm not talking about the outside community. I'm talking about the community of believers lifting one and each other up, praying for one another when, when someone's hurting, lifting each other up and helping one another run this race successfully. But we can't just love our church family. We have to and, and put ourselves just in like a, a Christian bubble where we just want to be around people that are Christians. We need to, to be like Jesus, drawn to love people, even the, again, air quotes, Repulsive, I'm thinking about this man walking down the aisle at Jim's, with Jim Cimbala. This repulsive sinners who desperately need Jesus. In verse 2 it says that sometimes God will test the authenticity of our love for people who are in need. It says this in verse 2. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. This verse has rocked my world. I mean, literally rocked my world. How many times have I entertained angels and failed? Failed miserably, choosing myself over helping others. Regardless, our call to be hospitable to strangers isn't because we may be doing it to angels. It has nothing to do with it. If you remember Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, Jesus talks about the end times, the judgment and he talks about sheep and goats. And he says, you'll be separated between sheep and goats. And one of the things that he says to, his, to, says to people is, welcome to my kingdom. Because when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, when I was naked, when I was sick, you did this to the least of these. And they're like, I don't remember doing that. And they're like, well, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And then the other side, the goats, he says, depart from me. I knew you not. Because whenever the least of these were here, you did nothing. So depart from me. So it's not about doing it because an angel might be watching, but because we're doing it for Christ Jesus. We're not doing it necessarily for other people, but we're doing it because we love Jesus. And so we're hospitable to strangers and people that are lost and, and repulsive because we're doing it for Jesus. Verse 3 even goes on so far to say that uh, we should love people in such a way that you feel their pain in your own body. Verse 16 tells us, don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. See, we can please God by making sacrifices for other people, even if we don't 
get anything in return. And that's a hard pill to swallow for some of us, even myself. That we do things even though we might not get a thank you. We do things even though they don't deserve it. We do things because it's the right thing to do and Christ died for us while we were still sinners and didn't deserve it as well. Do good and share in all the blessings we have received from God. I always try to remember that everything I have been given from God has been given to me, not for Zach to have, but to be used for his glory. Everything that I have. My strength, my mind, my, my spirit, the, the money that I have, my home, everything that I've been given has been a blessing, not for me to hoard, but for me to use to glorify God and to build his kingdom. Which is why the writer tells us not to covet money. In verse 5, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. You may be asking, what does this have to do with loving God and loving people? Well, the more you love money, the harder it will be for you to love God with all your heart. The more you love money, the harder it will be for you to love the people, love other people by parting from your stored up treasures to help other people. That are in need. God knows you need money, friends. He knows that you need money to survive. He understands that. And, and he knows what you need to take care of your family. But remember, God owns all the cattle on a thousand hills, as Psalms tells us. He owns everything. Everything is his. If he needs anything for you, he will get it for you. He will take care of all your needs. If you are just faithful to him, he will be faithful to all of us. It says this in, right at the end of verse 5 and going into 6. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? What is there to worry about if God is in control? Knowing what he has already given us, if he is willing, listen, if God is willing to give his one and only son so that you can have eternal life, do you not think he's going to feed your belly? Do you not think he's going to give you the clothes that you need? Do you think he's not going to take care of your kids' needs? Do you not think he's going to do all these things? If he's willing to give his only son, do you think he's not going to take care of you? How much faith do you have in the God that we say we love? You know, I heard this story, and uh, I'm going to be wrapping here shortly, of this poor farmer and his family. And I don't know, this took place a long time ago. And it just touched my heart so much, and I want to share it. This family, this, this, this couple, a really strong Christian family, they, they loved Jesus so much, but they didn't make very much money at all. And so every time they would do a harvest, they would actually, like, they were so faithful to God that they would take their harvest, and they would pick out the ten best, like, potatoes, so that out of 100, 10 best potatoes, and they would donate it and give it to the Lord. Like, the best ones. They didn't just say, okay, you know, I, I can get rid of these 10 potatoes. No, they gave, like, like, in the Old Testament, when you'd give your absolutely unblemished ram or your unblemished bull, they would give their 10 best to the Lord. Not just money, but their 10 best of what they had. That's how faithful they are. Well, one day they had no money. No money, and they had no food. None at all. Now, I'm not talking about, like, what my kids say when we walk home, go home, and then there's, like, there's mac and cheese and all sorts of different stuff. And they're like, oh, I just don't want any of that stuff. And then we say, we have no food. No, they had no food. In their cupboards, no food in their fridge. It was completely bare, completely empty. And the mom brings all her family together at the dinner table. And, and she sets up the dinner table with all the utensils, all the plates and everything. And they all sit down. And the kids are like, and the husband, like, or the kids, more than the husband. Where are all the, where's all the food, mom? There's no, we see all the plates and there's no food. And she's like, oh, it's It's coming. It's coming. And she's, they're all like, okay. Like, mom's lost it. Mom's lost it. Okay, we're going to pray. Ready? We're all going to pray. And, and so she prayed. And she didn't pray for, like, money to go buy food. She didn't pray for money or, 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 or for food to come. She, she blessed the food as if it was already there. She prayed and said, God, we thank you for the food that you've given us. We thank you for blessing our family with resources, of blessing us with always in our life, a house over our head. Thank you for this food that you've given us. And all the kids are like, what is happening? There is nothing in front of us, nothing in front of us. And so she said, amen. And then the, the, the kid who tells the story, or the adult who is now, a, who was a kid at the time, tells the story and says, I, I, I promise you in two minutes there's a knock on the door. 
knock on the door. And a gentleman came in with a, two bags full of groceries. What is your level of faith in God and belief in what he's capable of? What is your level of commitment to the great commandment? What is your level of commitment to the people that you love and have, have, have made a covenant and commitment to? The writer of Hebrews makes a plea to his readers for them to honor the sanctity of the covenant that they have made in marriage to their spouse and made to God. In verse 4, I almost skipped over this and I thought, no, I have to share this. Verse 4, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to the one and one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. How can we love people if we can't love the people we have committed our lives to loving? Our spouse, our children, our family. How can we love other people if we can't love them the way they deserve to be loved? How can we love God and say we will remain faithful to God through thick and thin that I will serve you, I will know you, I will be your servant if we can't do that for someone that we've promised to love and serve? The recipients of this letter wanted to abandon their faith because of persecution and hate. The hate that they were receiving for following Christ and like them, we must not give up. The evil one will come against you with all of hell. Be prepared. If you're following Jesus, he's coming after you. And he's going to use all of culture to come after you, which he controls. Hope I'm not waking someone up right now. He controls all of culture. So I'm not surprised to see the world the way it is because he is in control of all culture. But we can't give up. He is trying to get you to give up and to turn back. But don't continue to make the great commandment who you are while making the great commission your mission. Let's be disciples of Jesus and let's make disciples of Jesus. Have faith and walk with Christ. You will not do this perfectly well. We'll make mistakes, but keep maturing and growing in your faith. We have to strive for being more than just good enough because we love God. We should want to excel in all his ways, becoming fully obedient to him. On this side of eternity, we will not be perfect, but God will continue purifying us, making us holy. This can only happen if we want it and surrender to him. God will work in and through you if you are willing. The question is, are you? Nathan, go ahead and make your way up here, bud, and the rest of the worship team. If you're lost in sin this morning, hear me out, this is it. If you're lost in sin this morning, I pray that you will receive the gift of the new covenant and salvation. There's no greater gift that's ever been given. Will you receive it? If you don't know Christ, will you receive what Jesus died and bled for you to have? What God freely gave for you to have? Will you receive his redemption? And have a relationship with them for the first time. Would you receive his forgiveness and begin a relationship with God? Repent and believe this morning. If you're already a believer, I pray that the Lord would draw you even closer to himself this morning. Would you this morning live fully in light of what you have re received in that superior new covenant? Would you fully surrender to God and let the Holy Spirit transform you and show you how to love him with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind? And love people as you run your faith journey towards your heavenly home. Would you all uh, please?